bonjour. Um, my name is Brian, and I'm a teacher. Uh, and I love teaching. Is any is anyone a teacher? Anyone a teacher? Great. Anyone a trainer? Same thing. Teaching is amazing because when we teach, we can actually change people's lives. Now, I'm also a hypnotist. Is anybody here a hypnotist? Yeah, lots of hypnotists. Anyone an NLP practitioner? Yeah, you're also hypnotists. Okay. Yes. Mm. Um, I love hypnosis too, because you already know, don't you, that when we use hypnosis, we can change people's lives. So probably some of you have already noticed that teaching and hypnosis are a little similar. Mm. I've been a teacher for many years. I learned, I, mil I learned the Milton patterns from Richard Bolstad many years ago. And they changed my teaching completely. I was teaching for 10 years, and then I learned it from Richard. And when I went into the classroom, the feeling with students, how students learned, everything was so much better. So today we're going to talk about Milton language patterns in educational settings, schools, in training rooms. Has, has everybody been in school? <laughs> Did anybody not go to school? Yes? <laughs> so, so, um, we have a lot of information. Uh, you don't need to worry, it's all at this link. Everything is here. You can download the, the PowerPoint. You can download, there's two papers. And um, I have a few copies of papers if you want to take one. If there aren't enough, just go here. You can download the PDF. So one paper is from Acuity uh, earlier this year. And one paper is from another journal. And it has all this information. So you can just relax and get ready to sing. Yeah. Are you all good singers? Yeah. Good, good. Um, anyway, Paris. Let's see if my remote control works. Ah, yes, Paris. I, I first heard about Paris from my friend John. Everybody has a my friend John. <laughs> Milton Erickson had a my friend John. I really did have a my friend John. And my friend John told me, the Paris is beautiful. And he told me the people in France are so friendly. And he told me the food is wonderful. And I came to Paris for the first time when I was about 16 years old. And you know what? My friend John, he's right. Oh. Because Paris is beautiful. And the people are wonderful and the food is great. Oh. Now, I'm very happy to be back here in Paris with, with my wife, Sarah. Um, we're back here together for the first time, and especially for the World Congress, because this has been a wonderful event. And I really think it's wonderful that we have this opportunity. And it has some of my favorite things, like hypnosis, culture, NLP, coaching. And of course, language, because language is cool, <laughs> really. <laughs> and humans, all of us, we're really good at language. We have all these different languages. Now, Sarah and I actually live in Japan. I've lived in Japan for 26 years. Um, I went to Japan when I was 21. So I've been in Japan most of my life. Uh, in Japanese, it's konnichiwa. Let's try. Konnichiwa. konnichiwa. Ah, I feel at home now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the thing about language is cats are not so good at it. These are, um, oops. 
that's my cat Johnny. <laughs> now Johnny inspires poetry. Late afternoon light, the cat knows she's not alone. Beautiful. But Johnny did not write this. Okay. It was a human. And this Frankie, something is stopping Frankie from learning language. Now, of course, they can communicate. Ah, <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, they can communicate, but they're communicating non-verbally. And they're saying, go away, we are sleeping. Hmm. OK, this, oh, thank you. The remote control is working. <laughs> Let's go back a little. That little boy is too fast. Yeah. Um, so humans are pretty good at language. Which of these is me? Who thinks it's this one? No, who thinks it's this one? Yeah? <laughs> Have I changed? <laughs> I, I'm much hairier now. <laughs> Even at the age of six, I thought language was cool. And it is. Here's, here's a remote control that doesn't work. <laughs> OK, here's a little boy. And the little boy goes over to his mother. And his mother is busy doing something strange. She's doing something called hypnosis. I'm sorry, son, I'm busy. I'm doing hypnosis. And the little boy says, What's hypnosis? And it's a very good question. She says, I'll tell you in a minute, but first, go over to your grandfather. Ask your grandfather, how is your rheumatism today? Hmm. So the little boy goes over to his grandfather, and he says, Grandad, Grandad, how's your rheumatism? And what happens, of course, suddenly Grandad feels terrible. Everything is awful. And he says, it's terrible, winter is coming, it's getting colder, I'm getting stiffer. So the little boy goes back to his mother and says, what is hypnosis? And his mother says, I'll tell you, but first go back to your grandfather, ask your grandfather, what is the funniest thing that you ever did. And the grandfather, he says, I remember. I remember when you were three years old and you wanted it to be Christmas. So you got talc and you poured the talc everywhere, all over the bathroom. <laughs> Everything was white. It was funny. And of course, granddad becomes happy. It's pretty simple, isn't it? Because language is cool. Now, he goes back to his mother and he says, what is hypnosis? And his mother says, that's hypnosis, isn't it? Because you changed how another person feels with just a few words. That's what our language does. Every word that we say is changing the consciousness of other people. All language is hypnotic. This is lesson one. I'm a teacher. We have lessons. There will be eight lessons. There will be a test. Mm. If you don't pass the test, you can't sing, OK? Mm. OK, when I was four years old, I had a teacher. And I remember this teacher making cookies. I was four years old. She was a big woman. And I was actually watching her from behind so I could see her big behind. <laughs> I can see it so clearly. And the smell of those cookies. And then you can hear her pulling the tray out of the oven. And then she gives us all a cookie on our plate. You take it and it's hot. And you, a fresh cookie? Does anything taste as good as a fresh cookie? Mm. That's powerful memory. But teachers don't just create memories. Teachers also do other things. 
like create beliefs. Now, my teacher taught me to write. So, I wrote my name B R at about this speed. I and don't forget the dot and the A and then the N. And I looked at it and I knew I had made a mistake. And I started to cry. I was this little boy and I just started to cry. My life was over. <laughs> really, I, I remember this feeling. I was so upset because I thought I have made a mistake. And that teacher came over and she put her arm around me and she picked up the pencil, my pencil, and she did this, one stroke. She changed an O into an A. When she did that, she installed a belief in me. I really believe this changed my life. I think at the age of four, she installed the belief. There is no failure. There's only feedback. That's powerful. Lesson two, you remember lesson one, right? Yeah? No taking notes, just remember. <laughs> lesson two, teachers install beliefs. Here I'm 16 years old. Now, when I'm 16, I'm a little better at writing. Mm -hmm. So my teacher gives me a whole copy book. And he says, please write an essay. So I wrote an essay. But before I wrote, I had inspiration. You know when lightning strikes and lightning goes through you? And then you start to write. <laughs> and it's perfect. Because thank you, God. Thank you. You have given me this. <laughs> but it's not always good. You see, this is my teacher's face when he's correcting my essay. And he said, he gave back the essays to the class, and he said, this is a torrent of indecipherable nonsense. I'm not going to embarrass you. He killed me. <laughs> Again. Every word was like a dagger. And then he said something different. He said something very interesting. He said, you are such a good writer that it is a shame to see you writing, write nonsense like this. That's clever. You are such a good writer. That's identity level statement. Writing nonsense. That's a behavior statement. <laughs> that teacher installed the belief in me that my identity and behavior are different. Sure, my essay is nonsense. But me, I'm a good writer. That changed me. I suddenly became so interested in writing. I didn't understand why. I thought, I want to get revenge on the teacher. But not really. Because he installed this belief in me. Because teachers install beliefs. Sometimes. Now, this is, um, this is my wife, Sarah, and this is me, and we're in Japan. Um, and I play a lot of music. So one night, I'm playing in a bar. And this girl comes. And the girl comes in the door. And I see her. <laughs> and she sees me. And I know that I know her, but I don't know how I know, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and I looked at her, and I couldn't remember. But at the break, she came up to me, and she said, 
do you remember me? Terrible question. Never ask somebody, do you remember? <laughs> and then she said, I'm Saiko. Now, Saiko is a Japanese name. It's quite a common name. <laughs> so she said, I was your student eight years ago. I was your student in high school because I used to teach at high school. Now, I suddenly remembered her and I suddenly remembered her whole class. Did I like them? No, I hated them. <laughs> That's why I remembered them. I hated them because there were a few kids in that class who were terrible. <laughs> and every day I'd walk to the class and I'd feel terrible. But I thought, I'd stop at the door. I'll do my circle of excellence. I hate them, but I will be in a good state. <laughs> and I, my circle of excellence is at the doorway of the classroom. And I step in, and I'm in a good state. And I promise myself, I will try hard. I will try to care. Eight years later, that student came to me. She was speaking really good English, and she said, in our class, there were some bad students, but you really cared about us. She said, I was so inspired by your class that I went to the United States and studied English, and I became a nurse, and now I'm back on my holidays. Because our words are hypnotic. Our words do have an effect, and we don't always see the effect of our words. But they're real. They're very real. I was lucky. I had good teachers. But that's not true of everybody. You know, there are, there are many teachers out there who install beliefs that are not helpful. I teach in Japan now. This is my classroom. These are my students. They're about 18, 19 years old. I teach in first year, second year university. Sorry, I'll go back there. When I started teaching, a friend of mine said, schools are not about education. They're about socialization. And I was young and idealistic. And I said, no. Schools are for developing the individual. Schools are for allowing potential to grow. I'm older now. Now I know. <laughs> Schools are not just about education. Schools are also about socialization. This is Japan. If you go into a classroom in Okinawa, in the far south, or into a classroom in Hokkaido, in the far north, on any particular day, in a classroom, those students will probably be using the same book, on the same page, with a teacher following the same methods. Japan is really good at socialization. It has effects. <laughs> <laughs> this is the outside. We can see the outside. But in Japan, the inside is also very similar. Beliefs are very, very similar. Now, I'm not saying if this is good or bad. That's not the point. There are different models of education, of course. We, we can have a model of education that encourages individuality. But they're both socialization. You are all different. We are all different. Whether we socialize and hypnotize people to all do the same or all do different, it's still hypnosis. Here's a good study. This is from 1966. Teachers were given the names of students who were expected to be high achievers. Johnny is going to do well. Mary is going to do well. Um, it was actually random. <laughs> but, of course, Eight months later, Johnny and Mary's score were way, way higher 
than all of the other students. Because beliefs matter. By the way, how much time do children spend in school? Before university, how many hours? Eight, hmm? hmm. Oh, I mean, in total. Hmm. Any guesses? That's primary school. 4,746 hours. That's secondary school. 5,400 hours. Total, 10,188 hours. That's a lot of hours. Does anybody have a client for 10,000 hours? <laughs> yeah. These, by the way, figures are from OECD. Uh, it's an average of all the OECD countries. Um, you probably have heard of the 10,000 hour rule um, by Malcolm Gladwell. He studied the lives of successful people and he showed or suggests it takes 10,000 hours to become a master. Now, of course, we know school is more than 10,000 hours. Students master the beliefs that are installed in school. 10,000 hours hypnosis, that's effective. <laughs> I'm not saying they learn the content, that's a different thing. <laughs> they learn the process. They receive the beliefs that the teacher and the system gives them. Here's another example. The little kid says, what is hypnosis? How many people have read Trance Work? Huh? It's a lovely book. Lovely book. I recommend that to everybody. Uh, it's Michael Yapko. It's, it, 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 it describes a lot of the science behind um, hypnosis. And uh, it's very, very well written. Um, this, the details are not important. Hmm? The point is, this is Yapko's definition of hypnosis. We can change just a few words. For example, the interpersonal process of clinical hypnosis. Let's change clinical hypnosis to teaching. Can be viewed as a complex interaction, blah, 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 with your students. We just change a few words. And a definition for hypnosis is a definition for teaching. Because you know it already. Teachers are hypnotists, right? They may not know it, but that's what they are. Some people have used the word educational hypnosis. This is 1972. There are four main reasons for a reluctance to use hypnosis in education. It's association with magic, entertainment, manipulation, and danger. Hmm. That was 1972. Have things changed? <laughs> it's still the same. It's still the same. People are still <laughs> saying about hypnosis, it's magical, it's manipulative. Mm. It will probably never change, but that's not the point. This girl is hypnotized. <laughs> <laughs> Teachers are hypnotists, whether they know it or not. Teachers are hypnotists, but of course, hypnotists are teachers too, right? You know, do you want somebody to come to you again and again forever? Or do you want to teach them how to communicate with their own unconscious mind? Isn't that what we're doing with our clients? We're teaching them to improve communication between the conscious and the unconscious mind. We may teach them other things. Do we want them to come back for 10,000 hours? Probably not. I'd be bored. I hope you'd be bored. <laughs> I think you're wasting the client's money. 
<laughs> we can learn, as hypnotists, we can learn a lot from teachers. We really can. Hypnotizing 40 people at one time, day after day after day. Installing beliefs very effectively, day after day. Hmm. Not always good beliefs, but good hypnosis. And of course, teachers can learn a lot from hypnotists. We're doing the same things. In hypnosis, in classroom or in counseling, therapy, coaching, whatever. We're changing state, changing focus, <coughs> changing beliefs, changing behaviors. You can help teachers. You have an amazing knowledge set that can help teachers. Teachers will affect thousands and thousands of people. Societies are formed by the beliefs of schools. If you want to help society, of course it's good to work with one client. If you want to have a real influence, work with the influencers. Teachers are often unaware of their own beliefs, their own values, their own language. They may not even realize how they're teaching hypnosis influences students. Because teachers should learn to be better hypnotists. And to do that, we can help them. We're experts at this. We are experts at helping people control state. We are experts at helping people to understand themselves. And of course, we're experts at using language. Tools like the Milton model. We have great tools. It's, it's a very good opportunity. If anybody wants to actually make a real difference for many people, and of course, make some money. Does anybody want to make money? OK, just checking. Yeah. Um, very simple. You can set up simple two-day workshops, even a one-day workshop for teachers. You could call it hypnosis, but that's magic. That's manipulative. Mm. So you can call it better communication for teachers. It doesn't matter. These are, these are some workshops that we do in Japan. This is one. It's an NLP course. We do an NLP course for teachers. This is a, a burnout course for teachers. We do many different courses for teachers. We train many, many teachers. And they go back and work with many, many students. Simple things. These are simple activities we can do. We can help them to be in a better state. Everyone knows the circle of excellence. Mm. Better self-understanding, particularly beliefs. Because they're hypnotists, they should know what beliefs they are installing. They should know their own values. They should know their own language. We can do simple exercises. This is a real activity we use with teachers in workshops. Simple, as a teacher, I believe. So as a teacher, I believe students are able to learn. As a teacher, I believe um, that the classroom is a fun place where people can grow. Hmm? I want my students to believe learning is fun. I want my students to believe X, Y, Z. When we know these, we can deliberately put them into Milton patterns and install them. Same thing with values, exactly the same. Simple exercise. Behaviors. Ask a teacher, video your own lesson, notice your language, notice your nonverbal behavior. How do you use space? Then have the teachers discuss. You don't need to be an expert on teaching. 
you're an expert on hypnosis. <laughs> Better language. So here we come to the uh, language for changing state, language that supports learning, language that installs positive pre presuppositions. Um, everybody knows the Milton patterns, right? Yeah? Has anybody not heard of Milton Erickson? No, okay, we're in the right room. <laughs> Whoops. Okay, that, that seems like a good time to ask your partner, how many of the Milton model patterns do you remember? Let's ask your partner. <laughs> oh, we'll talk about utilization later. <laughs> um, here, are, here are some of the patterns. That I mean, this is this is based on Bandler and Grinder's modeling of Ericsson. Of course, there are many other language patterns. There are many other techniques, but these are all they're all easy to teach. Now, I'm going to give you a few examples. On on the slideshow, there are examples of all of these, and so if you download the slideshow later. <coughs> It's not like, great, great. Thank you very much for telling me. I'm going to talk to God a little later and have a chat. <laughs> if, <laughs> if, yes, I may have unplugged the internet. I'm sorry. The whole internet may now be dead. <laughs> um, I, I'll, I'll get that. Um, I'll get it back online. If there's any problem, just talk to me. I'll give you a business card and you can email me. Um, so let's look at a few examples. A yes set. When I learned yes sets, this changed my teaching. You go into a classroom and suddenly you have an instant rapport technique. It's a lovely sunny day. Hmm? Yes. And we're here to learn English together again. Yes. You might remember the last week we focused on X. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and soon you have a whole sea of yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, we move from pacing to leading. And you can remember those activities. That's a suggestion. <laughs> and that means, nice complex equivalent, that means we can begin by Z. Why? <laughs> but we've connected them, so it's true. Tag questions, because hypnosis is fascinating, isn't it? Learning English is important, isn't it? This is a wonderful conference, isn't it? You guys are all stuck in a yes set now. All day you're going to be doing this. Oh, this is a nice one. You can imagine being able to speak English well, can't you? But that's a very clear suggestion, but it's wrapped up in a tag question. And you're changing the consciousness of another person. They probably were not imagining, but now they are. <laughs> Presuppositions. You can choose to learn the vocabulary for the test before or after you eat dinner tonight. Really, it doesn't matter. Huh? Yeah, you can choose to learn English every day in this class, or you might like to study afterwards from YouTube or all the other many resources. I don't really mind how you choose to learn English now. Really, it's your choice, isn't it? Really? <laughs> so this is, uh, it's lovely. It's not a real choice. It's uh, the illusion of choice. But again, it's funny. I use this so often. My students know, but they still do it. <laughs> so, mind reads, you may be thinking that, <laughs> you may be thinking that because you're in second year, English will be much more fun. <laughs> they weren't thinking that. They were thinking about their girlfriend. <laughs> so, I'm not going to go through all of these, because you know the patterns. Loss performatives, cause and effect, 
Because I've taught English writing successfully to many students before you, you are already beginning to develop better writing skills. Mm -hmm. Complex equivalents. If, if you don't remember these patterns, you can find them in any NLP book. Or you can look at the examples on the slideshow. Mm -hmm. Modal operators. Lots of examples. This one's interesting. Um, if I'm working with a client, uh, of course, I'm going to use analog marking. And of course, I'm going to change my voice. Mm. As I suggest to the client that you could go a little deeper now. So I can change the pitch of my voice. I can change the speed of my voice. Mm. I can change position a little, but a classroom, <laughs> that's a big stage. You've got this huge stage. You know spatial anchors? This area becomes an anchor. Now, I loved your presentation. The storytelling, absolutely wonderful. In my classroom, this is my storytelling area. I always tell stories here. So, this is my position of power. I am the teacher. Where is your homework? Mm -hmm. If I walk over here, I can see students' eyes beginning to light up. <laughs> you, don't, you don't tell them this is your storytelling position. But they know. You've hypnotized them. And they go into the right state. Mm. Um, so, of course, we can change position in the room, we can gesture, we can tap the desk, many things. Uh, with the blackboard or the chalkboard, use different colors. These are all forms of anchoring. For example, I always write the homework on the top right of the board. So students know that's the homework anchor. Ah, yeah, that's an example. Uh, stories. Um, one of the wonderful things about stories is that you can include all of the other language in your stories. So, the bear said to the king, now is the time to change. So we're using suggestions inside our stories. Now, your stories can be from your own life. Students love that. Your stories can be about famous people. I tell stories about bears, mainly bears. Uh, um, but any fantasy story, fairy stories, traditional stories, it doesn't matter as long as you include your suggestions in the stories. Um, I. I manage a collection of stories online. This will hopefully be back online soon. Um, it has about 280 stories. Um, and they're all freely accessible. If you have a good story, please send it to me and I'll add it and we'll share it with everybody. It's for teachers and trainers. And you'll have to change many of them and make them your own stories. Yeah, I give up on that. Hmm. Uh, there's the Milton patterns again. Um, Milton patterns work really well in education. And I know this because I've used them for many years. And I also, I don't know. <laughs> You know, you've got an I know and I don't know. And I don't know because there is very little real hard evidence to support the use of this. So over the last few years, we've tried. This is difficult. But we've tried to quantify the results of language patterns in teaching. So here's three studies. 
Um, a timed writing. In, timed writing is a common writing activity. Okay, you have 10 minutes, write as many words as possible. Simple activity. Now at the end, we have a number. So we can quantify. We have two classes. One class is to control, no language patterns. The other class is the experimental group, Milton language patterns. Mm. So you can enjoy writing more quickly and you might find that your pen flows along the page, whatever. Mm. Now, oh, timed reading is similar. Timed reading, you have 10 minutes, read as many words as you can. Um, oh, it's a pilot study. It, that's not about pilots. A, pi a pilot study is like a beginning study. So we're, we're not happy with all, the, with all the experiments, so we're doing more. And um, this is our research group, and we've done them all in Japanese classrooms. Uh, I'll just show the results quickly. Um, the details are not so important. If you're interested in the details, we have, we have a couple of papers which are also available online. Um, basically, we have a control group and experimental group. The experimental group has lots of Milton language patterns. The control group doesn't. Hmm? This is the difference between them. So a plus is good. Usually in life, a plus is good. Hmm? So we can see here that there's a higher average, quite a, quite a difference there. Um, in timed reading, we see the same thing. Not quite as clear, but we do see a difference in the average. The experimental group, the group with the Milton patterns, are performing better. Similarly, this is a, this is a much shorter one. This year I did in over four weeks, one lesson each week. The effect is much less. Hmm. The time is shorter, so the effect is less. Um, we still see a slight improvement. Hmm. So the experimental group is better. The Milton language patterns seem to improve average performance the effects become clearer and stronger over a longer period hmm? as we install more beliefs. The average performance is better, but who, who loves statistics? Great, great, I need your help. <laughs> um, for the last two months or so, I've been struggling with ANOVA and T-tests. Thank you. Um, and I've, I've, done a lot of, I've done a lot of analysis. The results, they are good. There is clear improvement, but it's not statistically significant. We need bigger sample sizes. We need to divide students more by level. We need to improve the studies. Now, research brings up another interesting point. There is kind of a balance between good teaching and good research. I mean, we see this in medicine as well. We see it in many areas. What we want in teaching is flexibility. We're Ericksonian hypnotists. We utilize everything. That's what we do. And for teaching, that's wonderful. When, when Johnny comes to the class late, we utilize it and make Johnny do a presentation. So that's really good for teaching. And to use the language patterns very flexibly in that context, that's the best. As hypnotists, we know that. Now, on the other side, consistently using a script, having fixed patterns, is better for research. Because really in research we want to fix as many things as we can. It makes it more valid. Hmm? So we do have that kind of a balance going between those. It's quite difficult to do good research. 
But I show all of those. Uh, I show the whole slide. Um, you see, I know that these Milton patterns work. I've been using them for 15 years. I see the students' faces, I hear the enthusiastic responses, I know. But that's subjective knowing. Now, subjective knowing is very cool. NLP and hypnosis have given us this, um, these amazing tools to understand subjective experience. And that's so important. Our life is so rich when we have a rich internal experience. On the I don't know side, we have the object of knowing. Because science is cool. I was an engineer. Science has given us so much. Progress has been primarily because of science. They're both important because they're both two different epistemologies. They're two different ways of looking at the world and saying, how do you know? And they're both so important. I mean, they're like, I mean, they're like yin and yang. Or they're like the dancer. Do you know the dancer? I love this. Uh, is it spinning left or right? Who, who says it's spinning right? Yeah, who says it's spinning left? Yeah, keep watching. <laughs> now, if you haven't seen it, you'll see it soon. She changes direction. Hmm. But the picture doesn't change. Our mind changes. It's a little like that. Because sometimes she swings to the subjective. Sometimes she swings to the objective. In NLP, We've been swinging to the subjective all the time. And subjective is cool, and that's what NLP is good at. But she dances both ways. For us to really understand, we need to become the dancer. And we need to realize that dancing is going left and dancing is going right. That's when we can gain true understanding. I'm like this guy, Curious George. NLP began with curiosity. And yet we hear so many people say, well, science doesn't matter. It's only about the subjective knowing. That's denying the roots. <laughs> we should be curious about how it works subjectively and how we can show it works subjectively. That is the only way that we will ever get accepted more in society. What we've tried to do in Japan is to, subjectively, we know that it works. We're moving towards objectively showing that it works. Um, we haven't been successful yet, but we're getting closer. Um, teachers form society. If you want to make a big impact on society, help the people who are influencing a lot of people. So better language, that's lesson eight. You do remember one to seven, yes? Uh, better language for teachers, better teachers, better society. Mm -hmm. Whatever your values are, whatever your beliefs are, if you're a teacher or if you're helping a teacher, it's good to know them because your hypnotists and teachers are hypnotists. So let's help them. Here's some of our resources. Um, this is this beautiful purple book, which was inspired by Richard Bolstad, because he's always in purple, via Milton Erickson. Um, this is, uh, it's not available in paper form. This is the only paper copy in the world. You can get it on the Kindle store. I think it's $8. And I think we have sales of about six, and we want to double our sales. So please, please all buy it. Yeah. Yeah. So.
<laughs> if we double our sales in one day, wow. <laughs> Um, this is a textbook that I use with second year university students in Japan. Um, it's, it's a book that we wrote that includes so many of the NLP ideas, uh, in particular for goal setting. A lot of coaching ideas. Getting this kind of thing directly into education, that's big. Uh, we can influence a lot of people, they will go out and influence other people. Hmm. Um, for practicing uh, Ericksonian language, these are wonderful cards. Um, they're from a company called Salad. There are different companies that produce these cards uh, or make your own. They're, they're just wonderful. Um, that's the, the story database, has 280 stories. When you all submit a story, we'll have 300 and something stories. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and of course, we do workshops. And I do recommend, do workshops with teachers. You're helping them, you're helping yourself, and you're helping society. Oh, but of course, I've forgotten better quotes. Ah, because this is a nice pattern. Thank you, two minutes, oh my God. Uh, the presenter said to the audience, perhaps it is the right time to realize that language is very important. Mm. And he said, John. You guys remember John? Yeah. Because John said, uh, let's sing a song. And this is a song that I wrote with these patterns, with these cards. Um, I took the pack and I dealt them out randomly and then I used each one to write a song. Now this has a very subtle suggestion. I think you might get the suggestion and as you sing along you might like to uh, notice the language patterns in the song. So it's very simple. My friend John, he's a very smart man, he said. How quickly can you smile? But don't smile too quickly, for you might find a beautiful feeling comes over your mind. And John asked me what happened when you smile. This is your part. My friend John, he said, let me see you smile. My friend John, he said, smile, 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 smile. No smiling now. You may be aware of a beautiful feeling as you let that smile spread across your face when you really begin to let it shine and that's the time you really fly and John said to me give me one more smile my friend John he said let me see you smile my friend John he said smile 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 to know how that smile can grow you can try to resist but it might go eventually right across the world the fact that you're listening means that every girl and boy like John will be wearing that sweet smile my friend John he said let me see you smile my friend John, he said, smile, 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 oh yeah, one more. My friend John, he said, let me see you smile. My friend John, smile, 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 oh that smile is so nice. One more of that smile. Smile, 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 oh last time. <laughs> 
smile, smile, smile. Wow, you guys are smiling. Yeah. Oh, I forgot to give you the test. Oh, well, the answers are here. Test will, test will be on Monday morning, okay. Uh, we have, uh, we have the, the book on the Kindle store. Uh, if you search for that title, Explorations in NLP and Language Teaching, uh, I have a few copies of papers, just two different papers, but yesterday's audience were very greedy and they took most of them. <laughs> Uh, so, if anybody would like a copy, take one. If you don't get one, uh, you can just download it off the website. Uh, the website is, yep, it's there. BrianCullen.net slash Paris 2017. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> ah.